So the rift is the first piece of evidence that proves that the sea floor is indeed for spreading. Because when you look at the rift and see what's actually happening mechanically at the rift, and as we learn more and more about it, we actually figured out that indeed um, there was some sense to the sea floor spreading theory because you can actually see the lava seeping through the rift and you can study the shape of the rift and you see the bands and how each band is, it seems to be symmetric on both sides of the rift. So the symmetry of the rift, the structure of the rift suggests that the sea floor is spreading. But that we, have, we do have more evidence to support the idea that the sea floor is indeed splitting because since we can't actually see the whole thing happening, we don't, we're not alive for millions of years to actually watch it happening. So here's some of the things. First of all, if you look at the actual position of the continent of the rifts in the oceans, you will notice something interesting. The rift is always in the middle of the ocean. So you see that starting from cutting Ireland, uh, Iceland in half, it will then proceed to the middle of the North Atlantic, through the Equatorial Atlantic, through the middle of the South Atlantic, and all the way down you find the Mid-Ocean Atlantic Ridge. So the ridge, no matter how aligned the ridge actually is, because you see it doesn't necessarily need to be lined up. You see one here, then one slide to the side, one slide to the left, one slide to the right, one slide to the left. And no matter how it's shifting, the point is, overall, it's going to be right in between the continents. You can see that same pattern here. And you see how it splits the Atlantic Ocean exactly in half. So the position of the Atlantic Ocean suggests that this is actually spreading. Because it just makes sense. It's spreading from that center. The same thing is true about the, this one right here at the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, which is causing the, the spread on, the, on another rift just like it. And you can actually see the fracture zone that it's, that's close to the rift. That's around here, around there. But then eventually when you go away from that, it flattens out in the abyssal plain. And you can see the continuation of, of that Indian rift right there as well. So the, the rifts are in the middle of the oceans, which, ex, which explains why the oceans are expanding. You see, you have another new rift growing right there in the Red, Red Sea as well. So the positions of, of ridges will give you evidence to support the fact that the ocean is expanding. Another piece of evidence is actually looking at satellite imaging. Over the last uh, 50 years or so, we've been actually taking pictures of the positions of the continents in relationship to a stationary satellite. And you can actually, over a course of a year, physically measure how much the continent has moved through GPS. Right? So for, with global positioning systems, you can actually quantify the movement of the continents over the course of a year. And some continents move as much as between six and one foot a year. So that's we're talking about almost between 10 and 30 centimeters a year. And so this is actually flowing. Uh, if you do this much, like basically a palm of your hand, is how much a continent will move apart from the other because of the ocean ridge. Now, that does not seem to be very slow yet. It doesn't move a lot in a year, but if you consider the size of the continents, you can imagine how much this is moving. And yes, it will take millions and millions of years for the continents to move completely apart from each other, but at that pace, they absolutely will move apart from each other. And that's kind of the idea. The fact that you can actually measure with satellites gives us some more evidence. Another piece of evidence that you have is the actual structure of the bottom of the ocean. If you actually see that there are way more sediments up here near the continents, that they're going to be here, near the ridge, that suggests something is going on as well. Now, of course, you're going to get more sediments near the continents because there's more life near the continents, so there's going to be more uh, biogenic sediments. There's also more erosion near the continents, turbidity currents, and all of that stuff. So it's normal for you to have that continental rise near the continents. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the, the sediments that come from life or that come from the continents uh, erosion. I'm talking about sediments that are there because of biogenic sediments gathered at the abyssal plain over courses of millions of years. So think about this way. If you have the ridge right at the middle here, right, and the seafloor is, of course, spreading from that, that would suggest that this area down here will be older, the corners will be older than this area here, which should be younger. Now, since the oceans are gathering sediments over courses of, of thousands and thousands of years, you can expect that there would be more sediment where the ocean is older because it had more time for dead animals to gather up there and become biogenic ooze. So if you actually look at the amount of sediment, you will see that the sediment layer actually gets thicker and you go away from the ridge and that the, at the ridge itself, there barely is any sediment, suggesting that that seafloor is actually very young. Not, it didn't have enough time to gather sediments yet. 
So yet another piece of evidence to support the fact that the mid-ocean ridge is in fact spreading the ocean. All right, and you see here in this picture, the same thing we're talking about. You see that near the continent is where you're going to get the most sediment, especially in the large rivers like the Ganges River and the Amazon River and then the things like the, the rivers from the, that actually hit the Gulf. So you see that the structure actually gives you a, a hint at the, at the fact that there's going to be a lot of erosion and deposition and life dying near the continents, and that's why there's going to be so much sediment. Uh, but if you actually discount that and you look at the actual amount of sand that's gathered as ooze, you will see that the actual area near the ridge itself is where you're going to have the darkest colors here, the darkest blues, indicating that, that that's the deep ocean basin where you have the least amount of sediment because it's far from the continents. And this seems to decrease more and more as you approach the middle, right? But, of course, this is confounded with the idea of continents being a source of sediments. So, alone, that would not be enough evidence. But we already talked about the rift structure as a logistic way to look at, uh, think about that as being free floor spreading. We talked about the mid-ocean ridge position in the middle giving you evidence of spreading. Satellite imaging giving you evidence of spreading. And now we have more. We still have more. If you actually look at the composition of the crusts, you will notice that the oceanic crust is very, very flimsy. Very thin oceanic crusts compared to the continental crust that's enormous. So the oceanic crust will be 5 to 10 kilometers thick, while the continental crust will be something like 40 to 80 kilometers thick. So you should expect to set, see a very, very thick crust compared to the oceanic crust. Now, that in itself suggests that the oceanic crust is different from the continental crust. And the whole thing is that the, the continental crust is that thick because over periods of billions of years or so, it's actually folded itself and gathered more and more material to become thicker the way it is. So once upon a time, this crust here, the continental crust, was flat, was in the bottom of the ocean. But as that crust was pushed and smushed together, it became this piled up crust that we, and we, we call the continental crust. And gathering materials over thousands and thousands of years, it's actually made of different materials. While the oceanic crust is made of mantle-like materials because it just came out of the mantle. Right? And so that means that the oceanic crust is going to be made of the materials which are a little more rich in magnesium than the continental crust, which is a little more rich in silicon and oxygen, the way the crust is supposed to be. Now, the oceanic crust still has a lot of that, but it will have more magnesium. So they will have rocks like basalt instead of rocks like granite, if you're talking about igneous rocks uh, differences. And that means then, by the way, that if you look at what happens when the oceanic crust meets the continental crust, and we talked about this before it's the idea that the ocean under crust is denser so it will always sink beneath the continental crust because it's made of denser mental like materials so the piece or the slab that is the continental crust oceanic crust will always subduct underneath the continental crust proving that it's actually made of denser like materials and if you actually take rock samples you will figure out that this this is actually completely different kind of rock now, another thing that's interesting is if you actually took the rock samples, and this is yet another piece of evidence that will support this, if you look at the age of the rocks, you will not find rocks in the oceans older than 350 million years on the Atlantic Ocean, for example. Why? Because the Atlantic Ocean wasn't there 350 million years ago. But you will find continental rocks as old as 4 billion years because some pieces of continent have been around for that long. So that gives you a suggestion that because you can't find rocks in the Atlantic Ocean, older than a certain age, the ocean has to be at least that young. And it's actually interesting that if you take uh, ocean drilling, drill the ocean and take core samples over here, over here, over here, as you approach the mid-ocean ridge, there's evidence that the rocks are younger and younger as they approach the ridge. So by the dating the rocks, you can actually figure it out. So looking at the age, structure, and composition differences between the continental and Ocean and crust, you can get an evidence that the, that the oceans are younger than the continental crust and that they actually get younger and younger as they get closer to the mid-ocean ridge, which just makes sense with seafloor spreading. And we have, had yet another piece of evidence to support this. Now, this is called paleomagnetism, or the study of the magnetic properties of rocks, okay? Paleo means rocks, magnetism, you know what it is. Remember we talked about in the last video about the idea that the magnetic poles reversed because of the magma flow in the inner core and outer core will actually be changing over the course of, of millions of years. And well, every time this magnetic field reverses, it changes the orientation of things like the, of the compass, where the compass points. Some rocks on the earth have magnetic properties and they have minerals inside of them which are magnetic and they're attracted by the north pole of the earth and so forth. So, 
if these rocks are forming at the mid-ocean ridge, if you have minerals, metallic-like animals, iron-like animals, and anything that actually has magnetic properties, and when you look at those minerals inside of rocks, you, the, the mineral that's coming out as liquid lava at the mid-ocean ridge is going to be liquid. And in that liquid, the minerals will immediately orient themselves because they're attracted to the North Pole to the north. So think about it this way. If you have a piece of rock that's still kind of, imagine that this is like lava, and inside this lava, you have these little minerals which are going to be attracted. Let's say the North Pole is over there and the South Pole is over here. What's going to happen to this rock is that inside the rock, all the minerals will orient themselves facing north because they're magnetic minerals and they're going to be facing that. But then what's going to happen to this is that it's going to hit the water and it's going to solidify into a piece of rock. But then when you study that rock, you will see that every mineral that's magnetic in that rock is going to be pointing a certain way. Now the interesting thing is if you look right now at the rocks at the mid-ocean ridges, you will notice that all of those minerals are pointing toward the North Pole. And that we call that normal magnetic polarity. And it's the idea that the, nor the rocks, the minerals in the rock are pointing to the North Pole the way the North Pole is right now. But the interesting thing is that if you actually look at the opposite, a little bit further from the actual ridge and go to the side, sideways in the fracture zone, you will see that there's parallel bands which symmetrically oriented around the mid-ocean ridge, central band. So at the same distance from the ridge, on both sides of the ridge, parallel lines of rocks with reverse magnetic polarity, which means these rocks in this band will be facing the opposite way. But why? The North Pole is that way. The North Pole is that way. Why are these rocks facing the opposite way? Well, the North Pole hasn't always been that way. At some point, the North Pole was facing backwards, back when it was reversed. So we know that somewhere around here, around this time, the, there was a reversal in which the, the poles actually reversed themselves and made the rocks look different. And since we can tell how long ago these reversals took place by dating the rocks, you can actually figure out how long ago this piece of ocean was made, right? So this actually works almost like a timeline, and you can see the same thing happening again. Now, on this band, again, you're going to have normal polarity, and the rocks, again, will be facing the normal way, the way they look now. But then the poles will reverse again, and again, you're going to have reverse polarity, and the rocks will be forcing backwards. Then again, you're going to have normal polarity, and the, the, the rocks are facing the way they face now. And then again, you're going to have reverse polarity, and so forth. And so you can use this. As, an, as a timeline of the, of the ocean, if you reverse this, if you consider that this whole piece here, this middle piece here, wasn't there before, you'll see that long, long time ago, you have this normal polarity rock. And a long, long time ago, you have normal polarity rock again. And since this normal polarity rock is alternating between normal reverse, normal reverse, normal reverse, as you can see here in millions of years, every million of years or so, a full reversal will take place. And you can see that here. 1 million years, 2 million years, 3 million years, it, it varies a bit. But what you can actually use this is to use a timeline of the changes of the of thing. And we call, and we actually give names for each one of these bands, by the way. And this is a pattern that's actually, you can use this, it's called polarity epochs, or how long it actually uh, has lasted. You don't need to know the names of those things, you just need to know that you can use this system to date. Now, another thing that's interesting, as you can tell, that this period here made more than this period here made. So maybe this polarity reversal here lasted a shorter period of time than that one did. Or more magma punched through in that time and it made a thicker piece of slab. To know the difference, you have to date the rocks to make sure that you can figure out how long ago the rocks have been there with things like sedimentation and things like that. But the interesting thing about this is you can actually use this system as a timeline of the ocean. Like, look, it's like, so look at the way it looks around the world. First, you can see the pattern of expansion here on the top right corner. And you see how the middle used to be like that, but then another band fits in the middle and another one after that. And I suggest you actually look at videos of this on YouTube so you can actually see how this is happening. Just look up uh, seafloor spreading and, and you can see lots of videos about that. Basically, the seafloor will have this pattern of alternating bands. And you can see the same thing. This is true for any seafloor that's spreading. This will be true here in the Indian Ocean on the, on the, on the pattern of spreading that's actually happening in the Indian Ocean. And you can also see the same thing is going to be true for the Atlantic Ocean and for the Nazca Plate on the Pacific Ocean. And you can see the alternating bands represented by alternating colors representing different time ranges where the seafloor spreading was actually taking place. So between paleomagnetism, looking at the age, structure, and composition and density of the oceanic versus continental cross differences, the amount of sediment that's gathered less near the ridge, more and more as you go away from it, the satellite images that actually measure it, the position of the mid-ocean ridge, 
and the structure of the rift itself, putting it all together, we have enough evidence to support that the seafloor is actually spreading. And because the seafloor is spreading, we understand how the continental drift theory can possibly make sense. On the next video, we're going to talk about plate tectonics and how this drift and all the other things that happen with the, on the inner core and outer core and mental are going to causing the plates to move around.